Shabbat Shalom. Today is a special day. In fact, every Saturday is a special day. Every time you open up your scriptures is a special time, is a special moment. Because every time you do that, you have to expect a miracle, right? So it is a special day. So let's open up our scriptures to Luke chapter 1. You know, there are so many things that are contained in this chapter of Luke. This is our sixth study, just on this chapter. And this is an important document because we are really at the end of the preparation for the first coming of the Messiah. The preparation has begun way before the first verse of the Gospel of Luke, even before the first verse of the book of Genesis. It has begun after that the Word was God, and then when the Word was with God, and when He decided to come and dwell with us, and to live with us, and to be like us, so that He might die and resurrect for us. This is the story of Christmas, by the way. This is the most beautiful story of all times, past, present, and eternal, that God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, so, might, so we may be saved. And be blessed for all eternity and share all the riches with the Almighty. There are no words I want to tell you in our vocabulary to explain the extent of this action, nor can our minds comprehend the immensity of this accomplishment. We can never reach that point, but only by faith, right? Only by faith can we barely see and touch the hem of this great story and be in awe. The birth of the Messiah, the virgin birth, the sinlessness of Yeshua are among the things we cannot explain and the things we cannot and must not debate. But we know it is true because it is believed by faith. It is so sacred. It is so holy. Its knowledge can only be given, offered and implanted by God Himself. It is a gift from heaven to believe these things. We can discuss and argue so many things in the scriptures until the end of the world. But some things are untouchable. In many ways, the Bible is open for everyone to read. It is among the best sellers. It is the most freely given book in history. We encourage the people to read it. It will bless you and open up roads you never knew existed. But at some point, it just closes up if you reject it its author, and all that he is. He will give you so much, but if you are not willing to receive the Messiah in all that he is, it will just lock up and become an incomprehensible sealed book that will eventually only frustrate you. How many start well? Just like the one in the parable of the sower. This one hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, and the first thing we do is to give him a Bible, And as he first opens it up, he begins to understand it. But the parable continues and says, Yet he has no root in himself. Or because of the cares of this world. Or the deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word. Choke. As when you take somebody by the throat. So the word loses all its power. This individual in turn loses all interest in God. And begins to choose and pick what he thinks best for him. And it is then that the Bible becomes a stony place where no fruit can bear, because there is no faith. Many, many of those who seek to debate the Bible cannot understand why we get so excited, why we get so enriched by it. They see the changes in our lives and the love that grows in us. And they cannot understand why two people reading the same book come out so different. So they cannot believe it, and so they want to debate us. It is all a question of faith. And the truth is that the Bible will either give you the joy you have never experienced before. Or it will frustrate you. It will even anger you. Better leave it if you don't believe in it. So the starting point in grasping the word of God, especially the story we're about to see about the birth of the Messiah, is the same as it was from the beginning. It is by faith. It is by believing that it is completely divine, with no mistakes, no error, that all those who wrote it were inspired by the Spirit of God, that in there are contained the revelation of the person of God, and our salvation as well. Beyond this, it will do nothing for you, as it is written in Hebrews. I want to bring you that verse. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, 
It is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. This is the mystery of the word of God. But it need not be a mystery since it is open for all to enjoy. If the author is recognized. The reading of the Bible reminds me of a story I read this past week. It was Chuck Rose, a freelance writer, decided to test the industry of the book publishing. He retyped the first 21 pages of a novel by Jerry Kozinski titled Steps, which had won a National Book Award six years before, and sent them to four publishers using the name Eric Demos as a fictitious byline. All four publishers he sent the manuscript to rejected it. Two years later, Rose retyped the entire novel steps and submitted it under the pen name Eric Demos to several more publishers, including the original publisher, Random House. It was rejected by all with unhelpful comments, including Random's House. All told, 14 publishers and 13 lit- literary agents failed to recognize a book that had already been published and had won an important award. How could a book that was already proven to be a bestseller be rejected by so many, and in this case, by all? This simple novel does reveal to us the inconsistency and ra- wavering man, uh, mind of man, that is. In the same way, how could the scriptures, how could a book that is a bestseller of all time and has proven to have changed the lives of so many be so rejected? So it is then true that the word is like a double-edged sword. We encourage all to read it, but if you think it's not from God, just leave it. Let's now go to this great divine book, the Bible. And the passage before us today is important as it relates to us the last events before the birth of the Messiah. And there is so much for us to learn. First, the last section we have covered last week close with these words of verse 56, Luke 1, 56. It says, And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. This was after that Mary found out Elizabeth was pregnant. Then she went to see her down in in Judea and spent time with her and both shared their joy. However, after three months, where the time for Elizabeth came to give birth, Mary went back to Nazareth. The reason for her departure at this time is not given. Perhaps she did not want the family members to ask too many questions because after all, she was pregnant and she was not yet married. And six months later, she came back to Judea, as we will see in chapter 2. Then she went to Bethlehem, and obviously there she did not find any family member, because she could not find a place to lodge, and even to give birth. Right away, these two events give us a good indication of the conflict between this world and the Messiah, right? His first coming was not an easy one, was not going to be an easy one. But from this account of Luke chapter 1, we can see that John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. This explains why Quebec's national holiday, the Saint Jean Baptiste, is on June 24. It is six months before Christmas, the date believed to be the birthday of the Messiah. You know, most Quebecers do not know the real origin of this date. It is simply because John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. And this gives us a great opportunity to speak of the Messiah to these great people of Quebec. In a way, Christmas is the fulfillment of the Saint Jean Baptist. And we should not miss this occasion, this great opening to speak of the reasons why John the Baptist came and why Jesus came. Something By the way, Christmas is something that was prepared by John the Baptist. Let's now look at the preparation of the coming of the Messiah. So far, these things revolved around two couples, Joseph and Mary and Zachary and Elizabeth. These were the pioneers of the new era to come. So far, the world around has not been involved except to witness Zachary's muteness when he went out of the holy place. But now we're... We are coming to another witnessing of a miracle by the people and their very interesting reaction to it. This is a last one before the Messiah is born and it is a very significant one. 
Let's read verses 57 to 63. This passage is different from the previous ones. As we're going, it's going to give us a peek into the society of the day. And we are brought to witness an argument between family members, a small one, but a very revealing one. And let's remember that this passage is framed by the great words of Mary, the Magnifica, and the great words of Zachariah. Something happened in there. Verse 57, it says, Now Elizabeth full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and family members heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. The mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your family members who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have called. And he asked for a writing tablet. He wrote saying his name is John. So they marveled. Here we're given a glance into the social life of the time. It was a time to circumcise a child. And it was a very joyful event for everyone, of course, except for the child. Circumcision, I want to tell you, is the oldest ritual in Judaism. Jewish babies since the time of Abraham, some 4,000 years for for some 4,000 years, they are circumcised on the eighth day. And this represents a physical sign of the covenant between God and Israel. An unconditional covenant. This covenant was reaffirmed, by the way, in the Mosaic Law by Moses. So there are two commandments for it. See that the promises of God given to Abraham are very much alive in Jewish thoughts. And they are taken very seriously to the point that they are having their babies still circumcised. These are promises that involve the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. And the fulfillment of the promises that have not yet come to pass. These promises were in the mind of Mary when she mentioned Abraham in the Magnifica, if you remember. And the same were also present in Zachariah's mind, as he also mentions Abraham's promises in the prayer that follows. These promises were also in Stephen's mind, and in Peter's mind, and also in Paul's mind, as all of them spoke of these promises that are coming soon to be fulfilled for Israel. This is what is enclosed in this ritual, a covenant, and conditional covenant that God made with Israel. Today the equivalent to circumcision is not baptism, but it is what? The circumcision of the heart. Above the law was the spirit of the law. Something that was already known in the Old Testament. Today to circumcise our heart is to accept God's new covenant with us. And to live according to the precepts of His Son, to the love of the Messiah that we find in all of the Scriptures, all the New Testament. Remember Moses. Do you know that, this I find extraordinary, do you know that for 40 years the people were actually not circumcised in the desert. Moses never insisted on physical circumcision. He's the one who gave the law. But he insisted on one thing and he repeated one thing over and over. He says, Circumcise your heart. He already understood the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the gospel is the same everywhere in the scriptures. The most important is the heart. Even Moses, the lawgiver, understood this. And we never see him being scolded by God. Because he, like many others in the Hebrew scriptures, already understood. Let me bring you to one verse in Deuteronomy 36. Instead of implementing the physical aspect of the law... Moses says, and the Lord your God will circumcise what? Your heart and the heart of your descendants. The more one reads the Bible, the more one will see such a resemblance between men and women of God and the Messiah himself. Because one more time, it is all across the scriptures. And so it was a time to name the baby, which is done even today was a great joyful event and some of you parents know how difficult it is to name a child and to go through a list of names in the internet and also in the book of names trying to find out what will be the most outstanding name and it becomes even more difficult when the whole family is involved and all kinds of names are thrown left and right this is when I really get impressed by the way with Adam 
Adam's intelligence. You know, the Bible says that God brought all the animals. And in Genesis 2, we read that whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. He named them all by himself. Yet today, just to find one name, it takes us sometimes nine months. And after, we're not even sure. But the people of Israel at that time, actually, they did, did not have such a problem. Like we have today. They named their children, their child, by the name of the father only. Everyone did this, everyone in Israel, until the day John the Baptist was about to be circumcised. Something happened in Israel. The story here, while it may appear mundane and non-essential, gives us a very revealing preview of the condition of Jewish society of the time. And how they were so set in their ways. This incident here really brings us to see the very strong odds John the Baptist and even Jesus were soon to face. Let's see one more time. Let's see closely the text, what it tells us, and see how this is revealed to us. The first thing we see in verse 58 is that they were all rejoicing. You know, circumcision even in our days is a great time of rejoicing when a baby is about to be circumcised in religious community, you know, you don't have to be invited. You just go. The whole community is invited and this is reflected in verse 58 where we read that the neighbors and family members were involved. It was not just a family affair. It was almost the whole region that was coming to witness this event. And notice verse 59. It says that they came to circumcise the child and they would have called them by the name of his father Zacharias. Who are the they, by the way? Not the parents. Because they did not want to name their child Zacharias, they wanted to name him John. But the neighbors and their relatives were so sure and ingrained in their traditional ways that we read that they came and they wanted to call him Zacharias. Because this is what it was done at the time, and it was normal, everybody did this. And just imagine the surprise when Elizabeth told them that the name would be John. That was a tragedy, by the way, almost. They could not believe it. How can you do that? You are changing the whole world. It was never done before. You are disturbing the whole Israeli society. And so what they decided to do is to bypass Elizabeth. Maybe she lost her marbles. It matters not that she is the mother. So they go... To the father. Tradition is tradition. And so he should be named Zacharias. And in verse 62. They ask the father. Maybe he's normal. But Zacharias. Who could not speak. Wrote on a tablet. His name is John. That was the beginning of a revolution. And this action. As small as it might appear. Just tell us how the people of the time. And even now. Are so set in their ways. And notice now the last words of verse 63. So they marveled, it says. They were amazed. They were astonished. There's irony here, by the way. Do you know when you marvel? is when you see a miracle. As when the disciples saw that Jesus stopped the wind. So they marveled. It's the same word. Here it is the wind of tradition that was beginning to be slowed down and eventually stopped. It is the wind of the majority winds that was beginning to dwindle. Because the Messiah was coming. Not in the way the people expected him, but through the back door. Unexpectedly. And even today, people are still amazed. When you tell them that Jesus is the Messiah. When you tell them that Yeshua is the Messiah. It's not normal, they say. How can you believe in Jesus when the rabbis do not? Or how can you say that Mary had other children when so many people say she did not? And this amazement, this tenacity of the ways of the time, this solid tradition give us a clear idea of the formidable wall John the Baptist and the Messiah were to face and were going to confront in the gospel. As it was then, so it is today, by the way. Were you not confronted with your newly found faith that truly really goes against the tradition of your family religion? But all of us must find the strength to say his name is John. This was the problem of the devotees of traditional and institutional religion of Judaism of the day. 
From the very beginning it was like this. From the very first prophet Samuel. Who thought to have gone against the popular desire to build a temple. A tangible place to house God. He came out with these strong words. He says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. What do you mean Samuel? The whole of Israel wants to build a temple and even today it is in the Jews daily prayer. And you imply we really do not need it. That is better and enough to obey than to do all these things. From Samuel to all the prophets, these were all marginals. They were not liked by the majority because like Zachary and Elizabeth, they also said his name is John because this is what God says. What Zachariah really wrote on the table, really, he wrote, his name is revolution. Because a revolution has begun in Israel and it was to spread around the world and change it as no other event ever changed our world. The coming of the Messiah. Jesus was coming and things were about to be transformed and transformed radically. But there was so much resistance even now. And we need to realize the power of tradition when trying to understand the gospel. In fact, the new religion that was in place when the Messiah came to Israel, the religion of the Pharisees, he called the tradition of the elders. That was and still is in great opposition to the word of God. We have to realize that. We have to tell them this. Yeshua complained that the religious leaders of the And the people failed to recognize that he represented a new system dealing between God and man. The new system that looked at the heart and not only at the outside. One that focused on forgiveness rather than outward righteousness. Just like the new life you receive when you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And for us today, this incident reveals to us the difference between us and the world. The same type of revolution that occurs when you first believed, as there was a change, it is the same as there was a change in the world with Elizabeth and Zachariah. As drastic the change was in the world, so it must be in our lives. This is the practical aspect of what we're learning here. This is why we often have a hard time to adjust to our new life. We often fail to see that a change is required. And we spend our times going from one camp to the other and wonder why things are not moving in our lives. We act very much like the neighbors and the relatives because we also repeatedly resist changes in our lives. The truth is that few believers are completely open to major spiritual changes in their lives because change is often painful. This is very much the story of many of our lives who are so afraid to change because we like faith. We forfeit our ability to draw from God and focus on this world and we become glued to our ways. But an openness to radical change in our life is essential for significant progress in our sanctification and for receiving the blessings in our life. Right? It has to be radical change in our life. The more, the faster we realize this, and the faster we're going to get blessings from the Lord. Remember the parable of Jesus in Luke 5, verse 39? He says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be sp- spilled, and the wineskin will be ruined. Right? What did he mean by that? He is simply telling us that we cannot have both worlds. And that we must make a decision, otherwise we will constantly live in conflict, in internal conflict. What happens when you put new wine into old wine skin, the wine will ferment. And the skin has already been stretched, so there's no more room. So what happens? It bursts. And how many times it needs to burst before we realize that we need a new skin that we need to live with our Messiah. We often have this tendency to, this urge to incorporate the things of the world into our new lives because we do not want to let go. We want the best of it all. 
And at the end we become so unhappy, we become so miserable. We need to put the new one into the new one skin. We need to allow the Spirit of God to fill us so we may grow and grow in bringing things from this world in our lives. We do not allow, I want to tell you, the Spirit to work in us. There is no room for both of them. You know, there's a word in English that those who stick to their old lives is given and do not let God work in them. The word is die hard. I don't know if you must have heard of this, of course. I tell you how it's defined. It is defined as becoming indifferent to die to worldly things or for worldly things. This is a fitting definition since we are told really to die to our old lives, right? Romans 6, 8. One of the many passages that speaks of our sanctification. It says, if we died with Christ, with the Messiah, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Die and live. This is what we have to understand. We die to one and we live with the other. A new life and blessings in the Messiah require a dying, a dying of the old ways. We cannot put the two together. And there's one more word we use for someone who is set in his ways. And no matter what, he does not want to change. The word is stubborn. Right? I love the definition of the dictionary. Stubborn, unreasonably, and or perversely and yielding. This is what it says. Or as a sub-definition. It says, difficult to handle, to manage, or treat. So are the people who are in both worlds, right? And so is our lives, if we have a foot here and a foot there. Someone said that some minds are like finished concrete. Thoroughly mixed and permanently set. This is a tragedy. When you deal with God, because a believer will always be called to change. We're going from change to change. We're going, the Bible says, from glory to glory. The believer is really called to have an open mind and to be ready always to change. There's one more verse I want to share with you when it comes to traditions and customs, especially when these things that surround us often come in conflict with our way of believing. It's okay to have traditions. It's okay to incorporate them as long as they don't go with the the word. This is what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 6.12. It says, All things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. This is what we have to remember. Do you see the freedom of thoughts here? What Paul is here saying is that as long as something does not go against the word, you are free to do it, you are free to adopt it, or you are free to live it. But in all cases, we should not be brought under the power of any of those things. Because as a child of God, you have been raised way above all these things. Are you willing to change your opinion about something you believe for so long? Are you willing to change your schedule that you followed for so long, faithfully? Are you tied to something that is not worth it? Are you free to do what you want? My favorite verse, or one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 3.17. When the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty. Freedom, liberty. This is what this new life in the Messiah will bring to you. Freedom from traditions. Freedom... For putting them away or for bringing them in. It is complete freedom when you are in the Word and filled with the Spirit of God. You know, have you heard of uh, Castle Ward? This is a stately home. It's built in the 1760s, about 30 miles from Belfast, Ireland. I went on the internet to find out. Actually, it's a touristic attraction today. And you can go there and spend a whole day. The original owners of the house were Bernard Ward and his wife, Lady Anne. One of the most striking features of the house is its two styles of architecture. So the rear of the house is built in Gothic style, while the front is neoclassic, very different. It's built that way because Bernard and Lady Anne could not agree on one style. Not only did they differ in the architectural preferences, they apparently had other differences because Lady Anne eventually walked out of the marriage. This is an example of stubbornness. When two people, just like the neighbors of Elizabeth and their relatives, were set in their ways and had so much difficulties actually in letting go. 
And depending on your point of view, when you look at this house, the house is either a celebration of diversity or a monument of stubbornness, right? But the house of God and our lives should be viewed as really a celebration of diversity where everyone brings in his own traditions, his cultures and adapts them to our community and not the opposite way. Like this when we become actually great examples for the outside world. Let's go back to our text. There we see that the last words of Luke one sixty three. So they all marveled. These words do open up the door, by the way, to a new era of miracles. Because really, the true miracle happens in the next verse. Where true, genuine amazement should have followed. Verse 64 says, Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, praising God. That is a miracle. And imagine then how the neighbors and the family members were then truly amazed. The real astonishment is when Zachariah began to speak, not when John was named. You see the contrast between verse 63 and verse 64. It was in many ways a first opening of the public miracles that were to be found in the days and in the years that followed this event. It was the beginning of the reason of the season that is of marvel. Luke in his book uses many times the word marvel. He uses it so much. In fact, Luke reports to us not so much the miracles, but the, the people's reaction to these miracles. The word marvel appears four times in Mark, six times in John, seven times in Matthew, but 13 times in Luke. You know, so far these miracles occurred only between a couple and between Zacharias and Elizabeth, Joseph and Mary. But now the whole family and the neighbors began to witness A real miracle of God. All of this was in preparation of the birth of the Messiah. Again, we remember that there are five major ages of miracles attested in the scriptures. This is important in order to understand when you read the scriptures. First, the miracles of Moses to authenticate Moses, the man Moses, and the law itself. So many miracles in Exodus. Second, the miracles of Elijah and Elisha authenticated these two men of God and the ministry of the prophetic age that these men ushered. Third, Yeshua's miracles authenticated him as the Messiah. And at some point, you remember after his rejection, he stopped making miracles for the mass. He was doing it only for the training of the twelve. And this is where we're at, at the threshold here in Luke, at the threshold of this, these miracles. Fourth, the apostolic miracles authenticated the apostles and the prophets of the newly formed church until the word of God is sealed, is completed. Fifth, the other wave of miracles would be found in the working of the remnant in the tribulation times while the old men shall have dreams and vision and so on as we see in Joel and in Acts. This is yet to come. But today some say that there are no miracles. Is that true? They complain and say, why does our God work miracles today? The question is not whether God does miracles or not. The question is whether you see them or not. Because He does perform miracles over and over, day after day. Also, it all depends what you expect. Many believers claim that miracles died out when the apostolic era ended. Yet, these believers claim that people are still being saved today. If there are no miracles, there's a tragic contradiction here. No miracles, then no one is being converted because when a person is born again through the agency of the Holy Spirit, that is one of the greatest and I believe the greatest miracle that it ever happened around us. Yes, God does perform miracles of many different kinds, from healing the sick to finding you, finding a parking spot for you. All of these are very important. However, since we live in an age of grace, The greatest miracle is when the grace of God comes into the heart of the person and saves him. By the way, do you know what John means? Why did the Spirit of God insist to have the name John among all the other names in Israel? The name is composed of two words, Jehovah and grace. Yohanan, Yohanan means Jehovah is gracious. It was the beginning of 
of the miracle of grace with John. John was there to prepare the way of the Messiah to come and to give us the grace of salvation. His name is John because God is gracious towards us all. He was ushering the age of grace. Where the miracle of salvation was to become the most extraordinary miracle of it all. Right? What then happened when Zachariah began to speak after some nine months of silence? Let's just read verses 64 to 66. It says, Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them. And all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Something unusual happened in Israel. This fear, this true amazement brought the people to speak of their experience. And spread the word throughout the land. John the Baptist began already his ministry in preparing the way of the Messiah because there was an expectancy. The people were expecting something. And he started right at his circumcision. So when the spirit is in action, what did we see? We see there's wonder, there's joy, there's jubilation, there's praises, there's also fear. And we will see that this theme of fear is very much dealt with in the gospel and especially in Luke. It seems that Luke brings much of what, again, the people felt. Again, John mentions the word fear three times. Matthew 8, Mark none, but Luke 14 times. It is here in Luke. I just want to bring you one verse in Luke 12, 32, where we find these great words of the Messiah, where he says, Do not fear, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not fear, the Messiah says, and see how he calls you. Little flock. We're a flock because he's the shepherd. Right? I cannot wait to get to the very words of the Messiah where we'll find some great blessings. What happened next in our text is extraordinary. See the beginning of verse 67. Zachariah was filled with the Spirit. Remember last week as we spoke about the Spirit itself and the effect of the Spirit. So he was filled with the Spirit. And it is here that Zachariah... Because of the filling of the Spirit, completely changed. The doubting Zacharias became the giant of the faith. And such a source of blessing because the words he is about to utter are really from heaven. His prayer of praise that is called Benedictus from verse 68 to 80. Show us a knowledge that he has a knowledge of the word of God. And contains a synopsis of the history of God. From the present to the future of the whole planet, of the whole planet Earth, where he made up, he actually, he made up for the last nine months, he couldn't speak, by the way. And seeing all these things, one may ask, how did Zachariah, knowing all these things, could have doubted? But it is, of course, through the filling of the Spirit that he said these things, but there is another aspect here. These things also show us the power of forgiveness of God. Zachariah doubted the word of God, and at a crucial time in history, but God reestablished the man, and he blessed him so much. See the goodness of God here. Many could complain and say, how can God use such a man? Yes, our God knows the heart of man, but I tell you something, that God sees the best of each one of us. And this is one thing... We must learn from him in order to have a sane congregation and a sane relationship with him. And on the other hand, Zacharias was ready for this moment. We need to realize that this man could have been angry with God, right? He could have been angry at God for striking him deaf and mute for so long. But he understood and accepted the punishment. He understood the direction of God's punishment. It was for his betterment. And this acceptation brought him to be filled with the Spirit and to bring in so many fruits. The point is important because it is a sad thing to see that God, when God deals with people, the end result is that they draw even further from Him. We see this over and over. They become bitter and do not want to hear from God anymore. But the intent of God's punishment is actually the opposite, is to draw us closer to Him. And Zachariah, I believe, understood this point. 
This is why he's used to say such great words. And by the way, this is seen through the Old Testament as well. Remember Haggai 2.17, what God says to the Jewish people. He said, I struck you with blight and mildew and hell in all the labors of your hands. Yet, what did he expect? He says, yet you didn't return to me. He expected them to return to him. This is the ultimate aim of suffering. Whether it is through natural causes or else, God expects you to come back to him. Suffering means that God is doing something in your life. That he's doing something with your life. He's either calling you to change things. Or perhaps if you're really blessed. He's using your life as an example to others. In any case, he's present. And no suffering of a believer is in vain. This is what we learn here. No suffering of believers is ever in vain. Let's just read a few verses of the words of Zachariah as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. We will have, we don't have time to cover the whole thing. Let's read verse 67 to 73. It says, Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our, swore to our father Abraham. Like Mary... And like the Hebrew prophets, Zachariah spoke as if it was a done deal, right? That must be a great, that must have been a great source of faith for the remnant of the day when they heard this prayer, because everything around them pointed to the contrary. The people were oppressed by the Romans, by their religion, and by their religion. There was not much freedom, but a lot of oppression, that yet Zachariah spoke as if it was done. See that we are called to live by faith. We are called to live in hope, in hope of a new life to come, in hope of His coming no matter what the circumstances. The promises of God, I want to tell you, are a sure thing. Zachariah here is very well acquainted with the promises of God. He speaks of David, he speaks of Abraham, he speaks of the prophets, he knew his scriptures. And by the way, there's a new word. A new word that he uses here, first time in the Gospels and only time in the Gospel. This word is used in Luke and also in the book of Hebrews, the word redemption. He has visited and redeemed his people. And Zachariah being a priest was well chosen to speak of it because he was acquainted with the animal sacrifices. All these animal sacrifices all pointed to the Messiah who was about to be born. What does the word redeem mean? It does not only mean to be set free or to be covered. It means to be set free by paying a price. And this is what the Messiah came to do. As he said in Luke 4.18, again a great verse. To set liberty to those who are oppressed because he died for you. Do you see what Jesus came? And from what we are delivered from? Do you see the story of Christmas right here? All of this is a preparation of the first coming of Jesus. And for us is a preparation perhaps of Christmas to come so we can preach the word of God to others. The point here is that we are enabled to set ourselves free. Only Jesus, only Yeshua could pay the price necessary for our redemption. This is why Zachariah uses the strong word redemption. And there's another word in verse 68, one word that is not translated in most of our translations. It is the word accomplished. This is what it would say. For he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. Now this Greek word is important because this Greek word is used for God. It denotes the creative activity of the deity. In the Septuagint, it is used when God created the heaven and the earth. Now he performs another and more important action, that is of sending your son so that you might have salvation. That I think is more important. And also to redeem us. 
and the price. I want to tell you that the Messiah paid for our redemption is another precious fact we cannot fully comprehend. It is too high in the heavens for us to really comprehend it. But this week I read a story, it's a very so simple story, it actually helped me to see a little clearer. It's a story I want to share with you and I want to conclude with. It's about an orphan boy who was living with his grandmother when their house caught fire. So the grandmother trying to get upstairs to rescue the boy perished in the flames. So the boy's cries for help were finally answered by a man who climbed an iron drain pipe and came back down with the boy hanging tightly to his neck. Several weeks later, a public hearing was held to determine who would receive custody of the child. There was a farmer, a teacher, and the town's wealthiest citizen all gave the reasons they felt they should be chosen to give a boy a home. I will feed him well, said the farmer. I will teach him well, said the teacher. He will lack absolutely nothing, said the rich man. But as they talked, the boy's eyes remained focused on the floor. Then a stranger walked to the front and slowly took his hands from his pocket, revealing severe scars on them. As the crown grasped, the boy cried out in recognition. This was the man who had saved his life. His hands had been burnt when he climbed the hot pipe. With a leap, the boy threw his arm around the man's neck. The other man silently walked away, leaving the boy and his rescuer alone. Those smart hands had settled the issue. Many, I want to tell you, many voices are calling for attention in this world. Among them is the one whose nail-pierced hands remind us that he has rescued us from sin and its deadly consequences. He redeemed us. To him belongs our love. To him belongs our devotion. And this redemption, even though we cannot really comprehend now, we will be celebrating it in eternity forever. Let's bow our head in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is a wonderful thing to know you. To be able to drink from the water you have given us, from the fountain of living waters, who is our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. How easy it is to stray and mingle the things of this world with your word. How important it is for each one of us to stay always close to you and to test all things by your word. Bless us with your word and with your wisdom. Allow us to grow deeper in the knowledge of yourself and to really appreciate and learn from the way you so wonderfully reveal yourself in the first verses of the Gospel of Luke. Let our study of yourself bless each one of us as we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you all.